Graham will talk about the lives and legacies of Dobie, Betacek, and Webb, the three writers memorialized in the sculpture near the entrance to the Barton Springs. And with that, I present Dr. Don Graham. Probably the best place to do this talk would be over there where the statue is. But you've all seen the statue, I guess. Uh, when you come in to uh, go swimming, you walk right past it. And one of the funny things that's happened in the last few years is that the new students, the students coming in, I can't even imagine when they were born, like 19, uh, I mean, uh, 1992, 93, some ridiculous time. <laughs> anyway, they they really don't know who Dobie better check or they don't know any of the three. They don't even know who Dobie is, although some of them live in Dobie Mall. Uh, but they just have no connection with it. <clears throat> so I routinely send them, as I did this summer, I taught, I'm actually I'm teaching courses very week uh, this summer. I uh, routinely send my students over here to uh, uh, look at the statue, take note of it, to write a description of it, and then to pick one of the three men and write a little bio, uh, thank you very much, about, uh, about that figure. And the connection, of course, with me is very personal because Dobie invented the class uh, English 342, which he started offering in 1930. And uh, I came back to Texas from Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, in 1976. I was brought back explicitly to take over Dobie's course. So I've been teaching his course. Actually, it turns out, I realized the other day, longer than Dobie ever taught. <laughs> I've been teaching it since 1976. One of these days, I'm going to get it right. Anyway, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfect site, what I call a site visit, where the students come over and actually look at the place and try to try to figure out what's going on with that statue. And um, another example of how long I've been teaching it is Lee Daniel is back here somewhere. Oh, there he is. And he, he reminded me that he was in my, this very class in 1983. So uh, there you are. Uh, Philosopher's Rock, in my opinion, is kind of misnamed. Uh, it's, uh, it's to memorialize these three uh, writers, three figures associated with Austin and with the University of Texas. Uh, but it really invests them with a kind of lofty uh, uh, title, Philosopher's Rock. None of them, in fact, was a philosopher, technically. They might have had philosophical ideas, particularly Betty, I guess, but they weren't really philosophers. Dobie was a folklorist and a kind of uh, popular historian. Walter P. Webb was an academic historian, and Roy Betacek was a naturalist, which means he liked birds and nature and that kind of stuff. Uh, and the three men were very good friends, and the reason they came, the reason that statue exists is because it uh, pictures something that happened uh, in the summer months here in Austin. Uh, and what you have to realize, I don't think the former speaker got to this, but he would have eventually, that one of the keys to Barton Springs' popularity was that Texas was not air conditioned for a long period of time. Uh, Pre-air conditioning, Barton Springs was about the only place you could rely on cooling off. And that's why uh, Betacek came here on a more regular basis, apparently, than anybody else. Uh, he came and spent a lot of time here. Dobie would join him um, in summer afternoons. Uh, Betacek, it said, was, was here from May to October. Uh, I don't think Dobie was here that much. But he did come down, and uh, they did uh, uh, sit on this rock, which was right down there on this side of the, uh, of the springs, uh, and talk and, and whatever. And did they talk about Plato and Aristotle and philosophy? I don't, I don't think they did very much. Um, I think they talked about what most people talk about who are in academics. They gossip. They talked about state legislature and how stupid it is. They talked about the uh, Board of Regents. Uh, they talked about a lot of the same things that everybody's talking about today. They talked about uh, salaries and how they needed to get them up higher. And they talked about publishing business side. But I don't think they spent a lot of time talking about each other's books and so on. They, were, they, they had known each other for a long time, and uh, they told jokes. And I know for a fact that some of the jokes they told were off-color jokes. Uh, they liked dirty jokes, and they were just three guys who uh, happened to have had a lot of accomplishments in their life. But it wasn't some kind of, my, my students were always misled. They'd see the, the name Philosopher's Rock, and they assumed they were talking about you know, profound subjects the whole time. 
but they weren't. If they did that, maybe it was somewhere else. Maybe in the classroom, maybe not. I don't know. But uh, they were just, uh, they liked it down here because it was cool. Now, when I say they, it's really just two of them. Now, if you'll notice the statue, Webb does not look like a swimmer. First of all, he's dressed, all right? He's got his pants rolled up. He's standing on the ground. And these, and the, the two other, quote, philosophers were on the rock. And he also, so he's dressed in his street clothes, and he's got his sleeves rolled up, kind of like I do, and he has a cigarette. Well, he's not in his mouth. He has a cigarette in his hand. And I've always wondered why Austin let that happen. To set such a bad example for our youth. Anyway, the reason Webb wasn't down here is that he didn't know how to swim. Uh, and so if you don't know how to swim, all you can do is uh, lie out in the sun, I guess, uh, or observe the scenery or whatever. Anyway, I don't think Webb came down here very often. I think it was correct to put him in the statue, but they did it in a realistic way. Glenna Goodacre is the uh, person who made the, uh, who sculpted that uh, statue. I don't know if you know who Glenna Goodacre is. I think she lives out in Santa Fe. And uh, I don't know any of the other work that she's done. One of her major productions was Jill Goodacre, her daughter, who was a Victoria's Secret model and who married uh, Harry Connick Jr. All right, so that's, she has, a, there's a kind of pedigree of uh, looks, are I they think. Still married or what? I think they are. Oh wow, that's good. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah they, good. they may be going for a record. Uh, right. I think they live in New Orleans, which is his uh, where where his family is, is from. Um, so I wanted to. Uh, so to me, the statue doesn't represent so much a celebration of philosophy as it does a kind of a friend friendship, uh, uh, a uh, community of like spirits and uh, a, a kind of, uh, I'm sure there were intellectual ideas exchanged and so on, but to me, it, the, the statue is really interesting because it doesn't meet the usual standards or expectations of statues, because it shows these men without their clothes on. It shows two old men sitting on the rock. One is Betacek, and he has the book in his hand, and the other is uh, Doby, uh, and then there's Webb, who's, uh, who's fully clothed. And uh, normally, when we think of statues, we think of military leaders or statesmen or public figures and so on. UT, for example, is adorned with, with sculpture like that, Barbara Jordan, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, and all those uh, troublesome Confederate generals uh, there on the, on the six pack. But uh, students are always kind of surprised at looking at this statue uh, and the, its approachability. There is a sign down there that tells children not to get on the statue, but it's impossible to keep them off uh, because it, there, it, there's a wave that they can sit on there and feel like they're sitting with their bronzed grandparents or something. Uh, and uh, it doesn't seem to have harmed the statue uh, thus far. Uh, and uh, my favorite moment when I, when I came down here, I came down here to write an article about the statue. This was some years ago. The statue went up, by the way, in 1994. So it was sometime after that, maybe 98, somewhere around there. Texas Monthly assigned me to come down and write an article about the statue, what I thought it meant, and to kind of look into these guys' lives, uh, which I did. But while I was uh, standing there uh, looking at the statue for the first time I'd ever paid it any attention myself, there was a family walking up and the father in the family was asked, who is that a statue of? And he said, that's Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> and, and I said, must be the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost because it's in three, three representations. Anyway, so a lot of people don't read the damn plaques. If they read the plaques, uh, they can figure it all out pretty much. Uh, but a lot of people, and a lot of people don't notice it. Many of my students are very honest. They say, I've walked by that. I've been to Barton Springs a hundred times. I've walked by the statue a hundred times. Never paid it any mind. Didn't know what it was. Didn't care, etc. Um, so that's how statues work. If you think you're going to become immortalized by a statue sometime, only the birds will really remember you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what else did I want to say about their, uh, well, the, uh, let me just check for a minute. I, should I talk a little bit about their careers, what they wrote and so? Maybe yeah, I should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so they're here because they wrote books. They're not here because they were three old guys, two old guys, I'm just gonna say two old guys plus an occasional visitor uh, uh, in a suit. They were here because they wrote books, 
and were well known in Austin, and Dobie was really well known in Texas and nationally at that time. He was a national figure. Uh, I think he was on, they didn't have Rolodexes in those days, but from the 1930s forward, I think every editor in New York had, uh, every newspaper editor had Dobie's name somewhere, and any time anything interesting happened in Texas, they'd call Dobie for an opinion, because he could always be counted on to give them a lively opinion. And Dobie, I think, liked that, and he became a national figure. But the key to all of their fame, such as it is, is that they all wrote books. And Dobie was certainly the most prolific of them. Dobie started writing uh, 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 books and editing books in the 1920s, and in 1929, he published his first uh, a book by himself, uh, a, a Vaquero of the, uh, of the Brush Country, a book about South Texas ranching. Dobie himself was from South Texas, just south of San Antonio, uh, Beeville, Live Oak County, that area. And uh, Dobie grew up in a ranching family, and uh, I was thinking about these guys in connection with the University of Texas. Dobie was born in 1888. Texas, UT was founded in 1983. So by the time, when it was time for Dobie to go to school, he could have gone to UT, but he didn't. He, UT was still very small, didn't have any reputation to speak of. And he went to, Dobie went to Southwestern in uh, Georgetown. And the reason he went there was his family was Methodist. So he went, that's where he went. Then he eventually found his way to UT. We started teaching freshman English and just about starving to death. And then he went, uh, he went overseas. He didn't fight, but he was overseas at the latter end of the war in 1918. Then he came back and he taught for another year at UT. And then the most momentous event in Dobie's life occurred. His uncle, Uncle Jim Dobie, had a big ranch in South Texas. And he invited Dobie to come down there and work on the ranch for a year and Dobie decided to do it. Uh, he missed ranching, he missed being on horseback and so on. And Dobie says, this is a great sentence, I forgot to bring the whole passage today, it's a great passage. When he discovered his vocation in life, he sat around the campfire at night and he listened to uh, this old uh, Mexican-American talking about the old days when they drove cattle up the trail and so on. And Dobie said, I need to write this down, I need to record this before it disappears. And that became his life's work, was recording those stories and those tales, and that, that's what he did. He made, a, he made his uh, fame and fortune out of that. But anyway, in this piece where he talks about discovering his vocation, he says, so I left the university and received an education. Okay, because Dobie always had this edgy view of the university. He hated PhDs, with good reason in some respect, uh, because they dominated the department and uh, the English department, and they were very old-fashioned and very traditional in those years. They didn't even think American literature should be taught, only uh, British literature, and they didn't come up much past Tennyson. So it was all 19th century and earlier. So in 1929, Dobie proposed to teach a course called Literature of the Southwest. Okay? He had just published his book, and he thought that he had enough to say about that to make a, an English course out of it. So he took it to the English department, which had a committee, it always has committees, and the committee turned him down and said, you can't teach it, and he said, why? And they said, because there is no literature of the Southwest, and he said, well, all right, there's plenty of life, I'll teach that. So he wound up calling it life and literature of the Southwest. So anyway, Adobe, the, the English department was sort of right in a way, there really wasn't much imaginative work at that point in the South. West uh, writing, but there were a lot of uh, uh, biographies and autobiographies and memoirs and a lot of interesting materials, and that's what Dobie taught. This was before the age of paperbacks and so on. Dobie couldn't teach Larry McMurtry and people like that, even if he, I don't know if he would have, but he couldn't in those days because Larry McMurtry wasn't born until 1936. So uh, there weren't any, very many contemporary writers around that Dobie could teach. My situation is a lot better. I get to teach a whole bunch of people that have been writing in Texas uh, good books for a long time. Um, so that's how, Do uh, so then Dobie went on to write book after book after book. Some of these you probably have seen at bookstores, the Longhorns, the Mustangs. He wrote a whole bunch of books about critters, about animals of the Southwest and, and the history. He was very interested in the Longhorn. But Dobie didn't just write about the Longhorn. He was instrumental in saving the Longhorn uh, breed from extinction. He got together with uh, an, another, uh, a man with considerable money, 
and uh, they they went about uh, taking measures to save the Longhorn for posterity, and that's why we have Bevo at the football games today, uh, because he was saved uh, and uh, is there to cheer the Longhorns, the Longhorns, on on to victory. Anyway, uh, that's who Doby was. Doby continued to write. He did get into. Uh, I, I will tell you one thing about his politics because it's kind of interesting. Up until the late 1930s, Doby was what you might call a ranch conservative. All those ranchers in South Texas were extremely conservative people, and Doby was one of them. Something happened around 1938, 39, 40, somewhere around there, Doby became a New Deal Democrat, okay? And it was a complete radical 180 degree change. So he became uh, kind of progressive, certainly by Texas political terms at that time. Texas was a very conservative state. There was only one party in the state, by the way, so he couldn't become a Republican. Uh, I mean, he couldn't move from Republican to Democrat. It's all inside the Democratic Party. Anyway, he went to the left side, uh, the progressive side of the Democratic Party, and he started expressing opinions in his newspaper columns, because he had newspaper columns. He, he ran in newspapers all over the state. Everybody that could read in Texas in the 1940s knew who Frank Doby was. He was everywhere. So anyway, Doby started talking about such radical ideas as integrating the UT Law School. This was in 1945. And when he did that and wrote in the newspaper about doing that, he started getting hate mail. Uh, and he started losing part of his audience. The other thing that was going on, it's a long, complicated story, and I'll just give you the very brief uh, one-minute summary. UT was embroiled, this may sound a little familiar to you, in a fight between the regents and the president in the 1940s. Homer Rainey was the president, and the Board of Regents told him to fire two or three professors in the economics department because they were, they were communists. And he said he's not going to fire them. There's something called academic freedom and all that. Well, Doby Webb and Betacek joined in the struggle on behalf of Rainey, Homer Rainey, the president. Uh, and they wrote letters, and they held meetings, and, and fulminated. And Doby wrote columns about this and so on, defending academic liberty. Uh, in short term, they lost because uh, Homer Rainey was fired. And Doby had made himself such a kind of iconoclast, a gadfly by this time, that uh, the faculty, the president and the regents were happy to get rid of him. And Doby had taken two leaves in a row, a year-long leaves, to, to teach in England at Cambridge uh, in the mid-1940s during the war. And he wanted to take another one, and they said, no, you can't do it. You have to come back. And they were going to use that and test him to see whether he was coming back. They said, if you take another one, you can't come back. And so Doby took another one, and he never came back to UT. Uh, and the, the Doby rule, that's what they call it, is still in effect at UT. So uh, if I were lucky enough to get two years off in a row, I couldn't take the third. So far, I haven't been that lucky. Anyway, um, that's, that's the Doby rule. So he's, he's still. His presence is still felt among the uh, administrative rules at UT. Now, there's a site uh, on campus that you ought to, you might be interested in knowing about, because Doby's house, for many, many years, I think from, I think I read that it was from 1926 forward. He and his wife lived on what is now Dean Keaton Street, which is right. It's the street where the law school is, and so if you're standing on the steps of the law school, looking down uh, towards the west and the south. There's a white house down there, a two-story house, and it has a historical marker in front of it. That's Doby's house, okay? And that's where the Mishner Center for Writers is now. So all these great writers come in there. Uh, many, of, Well, not all of them are great, but some of them really are. They, they come in there, and they, and they have old classes. Uh, I taught over there one time. They said, this is the room where Doby died. I felt, I don't know, uh, I'd rather have been in another room. Anyway. Uh, uh, the house is still in use and so on. The other way Doby is remembered is, you may have read about this, heard about it, the Doby Pisano Ranch. Uh, they have fellowships. Doby owned a ranch, small ranch, uh, uh, southwest of Austin, about 20 miles out. And it's, it's still managed, owned by UT, and uh, the Texas Institute of Letters provides uh, two fellowships a year for writers to go out there. and it's. It's, there's been a lot of, lot of interesting writers that have gone out there and spent six months and working on their craft. Six months. Some of them can't stand it because it's so isolated, so many rattlesnakes. Where is it? It's about it's south. It's south. Creek. It's yeah, near it's near a zoo. Okay. There's Austin Zoo out there. Oh, yeah. yeah I know where you are. It's right yeah. near there. It's not open to the public. Yeah. 
but it's a beautiful piece of land, a creek right in front of it and so on. Uh, they're now in a fight out there with a developer who's kind of encroaching, so it's always, things are always up in the air with regard to the future of that place. Um, and UT needs to stand by it and support it, and I think they're probably, probably going to. Uh, better check, well, let me talk about Webb. Webb is the second best known of the two, and among academic historians, he's better known probably than Dovey. Uh, Webb was uh, uh, taught in the uh, history department at UT for many, many years until his death. He died uh, before his time in an automobile wreck coming back from San Marcos to Austin uh, back in 63. And uh, Webb wrote uh, a major book in 1931 called the, uh, uh, I'll be damned, I can't think of the title. Oh, he's, he wrote two books. The Great Plains. I'm always thinking the Great Frontier. That's later. The Great Plains. Thank you very much. Right. And uh, uh, that book was uh, kind of the best elaboration of a, of a point of view that, that the, uh, the West was settled by pioneers who had to be innovative uh, and had to use windmills and barbed wire fence and so on uh, if they were going to uh, uh, develop the country. Webb, later on, some of his most interesting writing was in the 1950s when he got very concerned about water issues and he wrote a, uh, a, a famous article that appeared in Harper's Magazine uh, and again I don't think I wrote this title down I think yeah I did not so I'm not gonna get it right but it's, you can find it easily it's something it's something like the the, the American mirage uh, uh, the perpetual desert and the American mirage of something like that anyway it's about the, the crisis it's, that's going to face, if it's not already being faced, by communities living in the Plains areas and even places like Austin. We've got, I see water articles in the newspaper virtually every day. So Adobe, uh, I mean Webb was uh, really out in advance on that, that issue. Uh, he also wrote a book that's kind of controversial in 1931 called The Texas Rangers, which is really a, kind of an over-the-top celebration of the Texas Rangers. The Texas Rangers were not the most popular people in Texas, particularly in South Texas, and there is a, a still a, a lot of resentment against Webb and a little bit against Doby because uh, they're, uh, uh, they were thought to be kind of racist, Webb maybe a little bit more in that book than Doby, but I think they were just part of that era, part of that time, and they were more paternalistic, I would say, and you've got Doby then talking about integrating, uh, bringing African-American students to UT and so on. So it's a little complicated. But you will find people sometimes that have done, you'll find in some uh, histories of Mexican-American literature or culture, you'll find uh, a, a criticism, a critique of both Doby and Webb. Um, so Webb, Webb wasn't as productive as Dobie. Nobody was. I mean, he turned, it turned out the books and the magazine articles all the time. Webb was a very good writer. Uh, Larry McMurtry, in fact, thinks he, at the level of style, he was better than, than the other two. The third guy is probably less well-known, but he's certainly very interesting. That's Roy Betacek. Betacek was 10 years older than Dobie and Webb, and Betacek was actually from Illinois, but he got here as fast as he could uh, when he was seven years old and he became thoroughly a Texan, and he spent, he, he was head of the Texas Interscholastic League, uh, which was a very important organization, and still is, because it monitors high school competitions, and it monitors such things as writing competitions, speech competitions, and so on. It tries to keep the level playing field, keep the uh, rules in force, and so on. And what Betacek did was travel around the state He'd go to various districts to see what was going on, but he would never stay in a motel. He would drive his car and he'd camp out. He loved to camp out. He liked to do everything outdoors, including going to the bathroom, number one and number two. All right? <laughs> that was one of his, one of his favorite idiosyncrasies. Uh, and he was, he was the, pro Adobe thought he was the most learned of the three, that he had read more widely than anybody else and thought more deeply than anybody else. So, but he hadn't written any books. He was 69 years old when he wrote his first book. And the way he wrote his book is Dobie and Webb basically said, you're going to apply for faculty leave for a year, and you're going to take it, and we're going to put you in this house. Webb owned a ranch out uh, south of town, 
out, out towards uh, Driftwood. That ranch is now owned by uh, uh, some kind of Eastern the sect. Parts on his job. Whatever, yeah, yeah, right. That's who owns that ranch now. That's Webb's old ranch, okay? And uh, they, there was a house I still there, I'm sure, a two-story house, and Doby and uh, Webb took, uh, literally took him out there and basically locked him in that room or that upstairs for that house, said, don't come out until you've written a book because you're so smart and wise, we want your book. So he did it. He wrote a book called Adventures with a Texas Naturalist. And that's his chief claim to fame. He wrote three more books. Once he discovered what it was, then he kept going. Uh, so, uh, but he, all of his work occurred late in his life. Well, by 1964, all of these men were, were dead. They, they, they'd all died. Doby died last in 1964. And uh, I think what I want to do right now is stop uh, talking about their lives and just read to you something that I think captures uh, does the best job of capturing what it might have been like to be here when, when Doby and Betacek were here at the Springs. Okay, so I'm going to read you something. This is from uh, a book that uh, uh, is virtually invisible. It's a book called Literary Austin, which I edited sometime a few years ago, uh, published by TCU Press. And if you're really interested in a lot, of, reading a lot of Austin centric Austin related stuff by a wide range of writers. I've got an amazing number of writers in this collection. I've done three or four anthologies and I, per although this one didn't sell at all, I personally think this is my best one. But anyway, uh, the guy I'm reading from is a professor at UT named Wilson Hudson. Uh, when I came to UT to go to graduate school, Hudson was still around. Of course, Dobie and those guys were gone. And I knew him slightly, but very, very slightly. He was a very, he was a senior professor and I, I was a lowly graduate student. Anyway, Wilson Hudson was a smart guy and he wrote, he was a friend of, 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 these, of these people, of these writers. So here's what he says. During July and August, from 3.30 till 5.30 every day, Mr. Betacek would sit on his rock and talk to his friends. When he felt himself getting too hot, he would interrupt the conversation for a quick dip in the bathtub. In a big flood of two years ago, the sycamore tree was snapped off. Its upper branches became filled with driftwood and the force of water was too much for it. Mr. Betacek had hopes that the tree would grow out again and it has sent out new shoots. He thought that if all the shoots but one were trimmed away, the tree might make a comeback. Once I said to him, Mr. Betacek, when you and I are dead and gone, this rock will still be thought of as Betacek's rock. Everyone seemed to regard the rock as his, and only a stranger would take his place while he was cooling in the bathtub. In King Lear, there is an allusion to an old rhyme, Pillicock sat on Pillicock Hill. I must say I don't know that from King Lear. Taking a hint from this, I made a, up a couplet for Mr. Betacek's amusement. Betacek sat on Betacek's rock. The water was cold, but Betty was hot. One of the most regular visitors to Betacek's rock was Mr. Doby. He did not alternate between the rock and the bath. The bathtub must have been a, a, a pool of water, shallow, yeah. He had his own way of cooling off. He would swim around in the deep water until he felt chilled. Then he would go up on the hot cement and lie down. He said the heat of the sun above and of the cement below would drive the cold deep into his bones. <clears throat> in the course of an afternoon, 10 or 15 of Mr. Betacek's friends might come over at different times for a chat. If there was such a thing as a literary salon in Austin, its location was Betacek's Rock. This is not to say, though, that the conversation was limited to literary matters. It ranged far and wide, for Mr. Betacek was ready to talk to anybody about anything. He had a very large store of information on a great variety of topics, and he was willing to acquire more by listening. Almost every afternoon, someone was sure to ask, was sure to ask Mr. Betacek a question about birds. I saw a bird the other day that I've never seen before. It was smaller than a red bird and larger than a wren. It was gray all over and had a top knot. What was it? Then Mr. Betacek would consider all the possibilities and arrive at what he thought the best answer. Quote, the only small gray-backed bird with a crest is a titmouse. 
Yes, it must have been a titmouse. So he told me on that last afternoon. I did not go to Barton's for a week after Mr. Betacek's passing. When I did go, I swam over to Betacek's rock and stood in the water before it. How many hours had he sat there over the years with his friends, talking about birds, quoting poetry, telling anecdotes, recalling passages in his life, analyzing politics, and speculating on the questions of existence. Let Betacek's rock remain unaltered in any way, unmarked by a bronze inscription. I love that last line because one, the flood of 1980 or 81, whatever it was, took that rock away. And two, there's not only a bronze inscription, there's a bronze statue over there uh, on the other side. So it's almost a, 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 a prophetic uh, a prediction almost of what might happen. He didn't, he didn't want it to happen. He wanted the rock to stay there. I think that was the theme of what that other fellow was saying is that everything keeps changing, but everybody keeps wanting to stay the, stay the same. Uh, that seems to apply generally to Austin throughout the city and environs. Um, let me say one more thing about Betacek. I think the best book by Betacek is, is a book called The Letters of Roy Betacek. He was a great letter writer. And this was, uh, he wrote long letters to Dobie when Dobie was in England. Do they all wrote each other all the time. Uh, maybe Webb not so much, but there was a very rich literary exchange. I think that's where the exchange took place more was in their letters. Uh, uh, and some of his letters are absolutely hilarious and quite bawdy as well. Uh, all three of these guys, is, again, were, uh, they, they had this uh, element in their, in their character. Uh, which uh, I think maybe other people do as well. Anyway, uh, that's about all I have to say about, about them today. Does anybody have any questions? Catherine yes? Catherine Ann Porter in your book? Catherine Ann, no, Catherine Ann Porter is not in here. She's a great writer, but she, I, they had to write about Austin to get in this book, okay? Right, I teach Porter, and, and uh, Porter can, uh, you should go down to Kyle and see her house down there, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, she, there's a national, uh, whatever it is, a sign out in front of her, yeah. Um, yeah, Porter's, Porter's a great writer, and I, uh, I think that Porter... For women, I mean, you know, women authors in Austin? Uh, you know, yeah, they're in here, there's quite a few of them, right, right, and including very modern writers, writers you, you would know. Um, and uh, the, the other thing I, I would say about, that I would say about Dobie and Webb and Benchik is none of them wrote fiction, and they weren't much interested in novels either. And the, uh, the three best writers, really the most imaginative writers, actually preceded Dobie and Webb, and they were all women. Catherine Air Porter was one of them. So I always have this lecture about the invention of Texas literature, and I do these three guys, and then I do the alternative version, which I actually agree with more, was these three women writers in the 1920s who wrote uh, interesting books and stories set in Texas that were imaginative and, uh, you know, were acts of fiction. Who were the other two? The other two, uh, Gertrude Beasley is almost totally, un totally unknown now. Uh, Gertrude Beasley wrote an astonishing book in 1925 called My First 30 Years. And in that book, she details in quite explicit terms a great deal of, uh, of of sexual abuse that she suffered at the hands of her brothers. This was a large, uh, completely one of the most dysfunctional families I've ever read about that lived in West Texas, but she was a real writer. And she wrote this book, and uh, I don't know if Dobie ever read it or not. Uh, he might have, but he never mentions it, and it was kind of suppressed. Anyway, she's kind of come back in the last few years. I included her uh, a work from my first 30 years in a book called Lone Star Literature. It's another anthology still in print from Norton. It has everybody in it, uh, all the important people, KAP and all those people. And uh, a lot of, boy, a lot of women read that story or that piece in the book and they got very excited about Gertrude Beasley. She's, unfortunately, nobody has reprinted her book. So uh, you have to read her book. If you want to read the whole book, you have to go to a rare books library. That's the only place you can find it. Uh, the other writer is Dorothy Scarborough, who wrote a novel called The Wind, which is made into a famous silent film. Anyway, those three. But you can hear their names aren't well known, except K.A.P. Now, the, the, one more thing. Today, Dobie, Betacek, and Webb are known only in Texas, basically, not outside of Texas. Some historians, some writers, perhaps, 
uh, no Dobie, but the other two, they don't really know them. They're not. So their, their reputation is pretty much confined to, uh, to Texas. And uh, this statue, one of the things it does, it tries to make sure that, that, uh, that their names remain known. And you can always, if you want to read them, uh, you can always go to any bookstore to be either the Texana section or the regional section, and you will find three or four or five books of Dobies in print from the University of Texas Press. Uh, I'm not sure if Better Check's in print right now. Webb remains in print as well. Any other questions? You, yes. You had mentioned uh, Webb's writing about uh, water and Harper's, right. but in the, one of the letters books of Better Check, it mentions that, like, right be shortly before he died, that he was working on uh, almost like it sounded like a how to for water conservation. And I tried to sort of track down more about that and see if there were some papers somewhere right. that might actually, you know, be his working papers. But I, w I didn't have any success. And so, do you know anybody who's like sort of a Betacek scholar or fan? You mean a Webb scholar? I, no, Betacek. Oh, I thought you said Webb. Well, you mentioned Webb. Oh, Webb's I mentioned Webb. You're talking about Betacek. Betacek, shortly before he died. Oh, that's some of interesting. His letters, yeah. Well, you know, his family, he's got, there's a lot of Betacek family members still around. I don't I don't say a lot, there's some. There's a guy named Lyman Grant who teaches at uh, Austin Community College. And he's the guy I would get in touch with because he's one of the ones who edited the letters. Yeah. And he would probably know. I, I, I do not know. It's interesting. I didn't know he got into that. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Anybody else? Modern Texas writers that are good, or yeah, what do we I, have on the level now? Huh? What do we have on that level now? Well, uh, McMurtry's really towards the end of his career, but he's early McMurtry's very, very good. I'm gonna put in a plug right now for a book you might have seen a reference to. It's on the bestseller list, uh, particularly in Austin. It's called The Sun by Philip Meyer. Uh, it's a fantastic novel. It's a big epic novel. It deals with uh, the Indian Wars, uh, South Texas, and uh, a, a woman who uh, becomes uh, very wealthy in the oil business. And I think it's terrific. Now, I have a vested interest because he was a student of mine. <laughs> and he was a missionary student, real smart guy. And he told me, and he told the San Antonio Express, that he actually got the idea for writing the book out of my class. So I, and I, I was just bowled over when I read the book. Yeah, it's great. It's called yeah, The Sun. You don't know who you're going to inspire. <laughs> yeah, you don't. You don't know. Uh, but, uh, uh, and a lot of books, that I'm sure there are books that I don't even know about. His name is Philip Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. You go to Barnes and Noble, there he is. Not he, but his book. <laughs> Anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a terrific read, terrific novel. All right, are we done? I think so. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah,